how Gentiles and Jews ended up working together and overcoming so many of the hurdles that led to the founding of the modern state of Israel against such opposition. So, let her rip. All right. Well, I... Thanks for that. I just want to thank Tommy, first of all, for for giving me such a wonderful afternoon slot. This is right about the time the carbs really kick in. And for those of you who've known Tommy for very long, Tommy is a night person. He doesn't wake up until 10 or 11, and there have been many times in our uh, careers together that I've called him at 8 or 9, and, you know, he doesn't ever answer the phone. On the other hand, I am a morning person. I wake up bright and early, ready to meet the day at 5 a.m., and at 3.30 in the afternoon, I'm ready for my afternoon nap. (laughs) This is what's known as revenge. (laughs) Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You haven't. I'm I'm saying you're not the Lord. You're the one getting the vengeance for putting me up here at this time. Anyway, I also want to thank Paul Wilkinson. He has done such a tremendous amount of research. Um, A lot of what I do, I'm a pastor. I'm not uh, a scholar. I don't have the time, uh, like Bill uh, Watson earlier, to go out, go to the libraries, and do a lot of the work on original documents. Uh, Paul's done a lot of that kind of work, too, and we're all dependent upon them for doing that uh, tremendous work in terms of uh, uh, original research. But I wanted to thank Paul for a lot of the stuff that he's done, but he gave me my opening illustration. If you can capture the essence of this illustration that he that he had in the middle of his uh, talk, you've got the theme of my whole talk. Whatever the details are, this, this fits the theme. And that is that often <clears throat> the... Um, The responsibility for the statement that uh, Israel was a land without a people and the Jews were a people without a land was attributed to Zangwell, who was Jewish. But the reality is he didn't really come up with that on his own. He got that from a politician, Lord Shaftesbury. Well, Lord Shaftesbury was was a Christian, but he didn't get it. He didn't invent it. He got it from a pastor. Now, the paradigm here is that coming out of the Reformation, there, there's a significant theological shift that took place that impacted the pulpits. The pulpits, in turn, impacted the politicians. So you see, by the beginning of the 19th century, a marriage of British government policy with the theology coming out of the pulpits in England. That, in turn, then works in its own stream and is distinct from but complementary to what is happening in the Jewish community. So that by the time you come to uh, Theodore Herzl in the 1890s, there is a long stream of things that have taken place in both the Jewish and the Christian communities that are interdependent, but neither side knew what the other side was doing. And when we look back at history, from our perspective, we see the sovereign hand of God. There are too many things, too many intricate details that are taking place in vastly different countries. Poland, Sweden, Prussia, England, Russia, uh, the Crimean War, uh, down to Egypt, uh, the Ottoman Empire. uh, Things that are happening in, in the shtetl in the Pale of Settlement, uh, things that are happening uh, in the Jewish community in the United States, things that are happening among the uh, uh, Puritan uh, uh, pastors and and theologians in the early 1600s, where they have no idea what anybody else is doing. But in the orchestration of of God, in his sovereign providential guidance in history, these things came together over a period of 300 years to produce a nation that was born in a day in 1948. And the story is fascinating. And uh, you have on the desk, uh, this is a work in progress. I started this some some uh, uh, seven years ago. Wayne House, who was here earlier, uh, and I went on a, a trip to Israel. And on that trip to Israel, and I won't go into any details, but there were some things that came out of that where eventually we uh, were accused of three things. And what I learned from that is that there's a whole environment out there that hates us. 
that it, and we've heard some of this from Paul, uh, the Palestinian crowd, the anti-Christian Zionist crowd from uh, certain uh, certain Christians, and what they basically are, are promoting is in their narrative is uh, because it appeals to the liberal Jewish left, and they're wanting to cr- they they see a danger in the unification politically of the Christian right and the the Christian Zionist right and uh, the uh, pro-Israel community. And so what they want to accuse us of is, number one, our motivation is that all the Jews should be converted. Uh, Number two is that the reason we want all the Jews back in the land is so that Christ can come. We want to uh, manipulate God so that if we get all the Jews back in the land, or most of them, Jesus will come back, and then there'll be the Battle of Armageddon, and um, all the Jews will be killed. And we're inherently anti-Semitic. That's their narrative, and that has a certain that plays amongst a certain crowd in the um, uh, in the uh, li- left liberal Jewish community. Uh, but when you get into the story, you realize there's el- enough elements of truth to some of these things, not to all of them. But but what's happened in the in the 19th century was that there was a transformation that took place. Movements uh, uh, pro, the British Restorationist movement was was heavily influenced by its desire to convert the Jews. And then as time went by, there was a, there was a debate that occurred. Well, would the Jews go back to the land and then convert, uh, be converted by God, as God had done many miraculous things in the past? Or was there a need for conversion first? And it, it, they debated these things. And as they got on the ground with real flesh and blood Jewish people dealing with them as they came out of Russia, came out of the Pale of Settlement in, in the 19th century, and they were dealing with real people and not sort of an idealized uh, Jewish people, they realized that these people needed help to survive in the land. And so you saw a motivational shift take place historically through the 19th century, whereas evangelicals, we believe everybody needs to be converted because there is only one hope, and that is Jesus Christ. But that is not why we are motivated to support the state of Israel. The two are not a causally related or causally linked ideal. We support the state of Israel because we support the Jewish people because they are the apple of God's eye, because they are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they are still the people of God. We do not support Israel, and we do not love the Jewish people because we want to see them all converted. That's a separate issue. They are not causally related. Uh, we know that Jesus is going to come back at some point in time, and the circumstances will be that most of, uh, of the Jewish people will have returned to the land. But those are not necessarily causally related. So that's sort of the background that motivated me down this path, and I've been studying it, and I've cobbled this outline together. It's a work in progress, and it, a lot of it's a timeline because I realize that as we... As we look and read and study about Christian Zionism, you get one timeline, and you read books on uh, Jewish Zionism and what's going on in the Jewish community, you get another timeline, but hardly anything has been done to show how they intersected in history. Now, if you want an update of the paper, it's out on my website on the home page, which is uh, www.deanbible.org, and you can download. I've updated it a little bit since the other day, and I'll continue to do so. Now, in the introduction, I pointed out that a recent book that came out in 2009 by Shalom Goldman was the first book I saw, found in print that attempted some sort of intersection of these two streams. His book is entitled Zeal for Zion, Christians, Jews, and the idea of the promised land. And he points out that in the Jewish community, there are two different views of of, uh, the role of Christians. One's represented by Evutar Frizzell in his article, Zionism and Jewish Nationalism, where he wrote, the author is aware of the historical interest in certain non-Jewish quarters, especially in 19th century England, toward the restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land. An examination, admittedly not systematic enough, regarding the relationship between these ideas and the emergence of Zionism Zionism suggests only a very marginal and indirect influence. This is uh, not unusual on the Jewish side to be 
unaware of or to deny any real involvement from the Christian side. On the other hand, you have Richard Popkin, a historian of ideas who wrote in the 1990s, much of Zionism has its roots in Christian rather than Jewish doctrine. So the purpose of this study is designed to show that the rise of Zionism, the impact of Zionism and the reestablishment of the Jewish state uh, could not possibly be an accident of history. The outline will enable us to see how uh, utterly impossible it would be for one group to have brought about the rise of modern Israel. For centuries since the Bar Kokhba revolt in AD 135, there have been numerous attempts by one group or another to accomplish the dream of restoring the Jews to their native uh, national homeland. But in God's perfect timing, he used a host of people in different nations, Christian Jews and pagan politicians, and brought about a new Jewish state in 19. Uh, 48. And so I am just want to look at, take a snapshot of three periods in history, if I get that far. One during the mid-17th century, during the time of Cromwell. And since we had such a great introduction to that uh, Puritan period by Bill Watson earlier, I'm not going to uh, cover uh, most of that territory again. I'll just hit a couple of highlights to remind us and then I spend most of my time talking about Manasseh bin Israel and his impact on uh, British policy. Then we'll skip to the early 19th century, 1830 to 1845, and then time allowing we'll jump to the end, the period from about 1880 to uh, 1997 with the first Zionist Congress. If I had time, I would go on to the uh, look at the makeup of the uh, war, British War Council in World War I that uh, uh, firm the um, Balfour Declaration, but I don't think we'll have time uh, to go there unless you want to stay here till dinner. I didn't think so. <laughs> I don't either. Okay, just a, a little background. In um, 1066, William the Conqueror uh, came across the Channel and conquered England. Uh, that he brought uh, Jews came with him, and it wasn't long before you had the development of a strong Jewish community within England, but then that led to uh, anti-Semitism. In uh, 1290, uh, Edward I uh, formally uh, kicked the Jews out of, uh, out of England, 16,000 left. Uh, in between that period, in the rise of Zion, uh, excuse me, in the rise of anti-Semitism, one of the most significant events was in, in Norwich, in England, in 1144. You had the uh, first blood libel charge brought against the Jews. That's where they're accused of using the blood of uh, Christian infants to make matzah for Passover. And so you had this this development of this blood libel. We'll hear about blood libel later when we get to 1840. And so the Jews are kicked out of England. And so you have an environment in England where there are no Jews and, and maybe a few snuck back in after their expulsion from Spain. But they were Moranos, which were uh, Jews who overtly converted to Christianity, but they were also called conversos or crypto-Jews. And there were just a few of those in England, and they were, uh, they were there secretly and illegally. Uh, it's not until the time of Cromwell that they are allowed back into the land. Now, what makes the difference between this uh, horrible anti-Semitism of the Middle Ages and what takes place in the late uh, 1500s and early 1600s is going back to the Bible. Israeli uh, historian Michael Pregai writes, the growing importance of the English Bible uh, was a concomitant of the spreading re Reformation. And it's true to say that the Reformation would never have taken hold had the Bible not replaced the Pope as the ultimate spiritual authority. With the Bible as its tool, the Reformation returned to the geographic origins of Christianity in Palestine. It therefore gradually diminished the authority of Rome. His point is, as many have observed, is that as a result of the Reformation, there's a back to the Bible movement uh, in Europe, uh, specifically in England. And as that back to the Bible movement increases in, in its, uh, as it's working itself out theologically, they shift to a, uh, a hermeneutic 
uh, that is based on a literal hermeneutic. This impacts the Puritans by the end of the 19th century. Barbara Tuchman in her book, uh, The Bible and the Sword, writes, starting with the Puritan ascendancy, the movement among the English for the return of the Jews to Palestine began. It is that group that is, uh, of, of all those, is most dedicated to biblical authority in England uh, at the time. Now, this influence derives from six basic sources, this philo-Semitism that develops. First of all, the Reformation emphasis on sola scriptura. Second, the resurrection of the study of the Hebrew language uh, by Protestant Christians. Third, the translation of the Bible into English so that people could read the Bible for themselves, and they fell in love with the Old Testament, they fell in love with the characters, they fell in love with the Jewish people. And so they identified with the Old Testament heroes as the Puritans were struggling against the oppression of the, of the Tudors. They identify profoundly with the Israelites who were being oppressed by the Philistines and the, and the Canaanites in the Old Testament. So they identify with those heroes or struggles or stories. There's a hermeneutical shift, a shift in how they understand uh, the Bible, what it means, as to return to a literal hermeneutic, which meant they viewed a literal kingdom and a literal future for a restored Jewish nation with a king in a literal Jerusalem. Uh, English Puritans saw the biblical prophecy of a return of the Jews to their homeland. Now, as that takes root in England, it has an impact on the Jewish community. Lucian Wolf, who back in the early 1900s was a journalist, and he wrote a number of books related to Jewish history, including a, a, a book on Manasseh ben Israel, uh, and an introduction to his life and to uh, the, sixth, the environment of the, of the 17th century. And he wrote, the Reformation in England first turned Jewish eyes towards the land. This is a Jewish writer, not a Christian writer, analyzing what happens in England, that it is the, the, the pro-Jewish, philo-Semitic attitude of the Puritans that first begins to turn their eyes of the Jews back to the land from which they had so long been excluded. Now, what happens in the late 1500s and early 1600s, as we saw from uh, Bill's presentation this morning, is that there is a, an increasing number of works that are written and published to uh, affirm a future restoration of the Jewish people to the land. We looked at people like Francis Kett and, uh, let me move past these slides rather quickly, uh, Thomas Brightman, uh, Joseph Mead, people like Giles Fletcher, Henry Finch, all of these people and many, many others, as he mentioned, set a stage of a theological shift that occurred under the, the Tudor kings. Now, they were suppressed by the censorship of the uh, Anglican church until uh, the, 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 the war began, until you get to the long parliament about 1840, 1841, and Charles is too uh, distracted, they're too distracted with things, the censorship sort of uh, shifts. And all these works that have been published from about 18, or excuse me, from about 1570 until uh, through the uh, 15 or 1620s, all of these books that have been underground and some of them had, they had attempted to destroy them, all of a sudden they get republished in the 1840s and this, there's a swelling shift among the Puritans to, uh, what did I say? 18, 1640s. And all of a sudden there's this shift in the 1640s where two things basically are coming together. One is a desire to bring Jews back into England. The reason they want to bring Jews back into England is they, they have shifted in their uh, away from anti-Semitism because they went back to the Bible. Th what went along with that was also a desire to help the Jews go back to the land because they understood from a literal hermeneutic that God would restore the Jewish people to their historic homeland. This has resonance within the Jewish community. Uh, uh, Wolf also writes, but it was the increasing Hebraism of English thought as represented by the Puritan movement, which chiefly attracted the Jews when the commonwealth with its pronounced Judaical tendencies emerged from this movement, the Jews could not fail uh, but to be impressed. Now the background on this is that in uh, 1492, the Sp Spain expels the Jews. 
And as a result of that, the uh, many Jews left and they scattered throughout Europe. Some went further east. Um, some went to the New World. But a large number of Muranos also went and established themselves in Amsterdam and in Holland. Now, that it is to Holland that some of the um, separatists from England go during the uh, 1500s, such as the pilgrims that eventually came to, to America. But one of the key individuals that goes there is the father of a uh, very important rabbi, Manasseh ben Israel. And Manasseh ben Israel comes along, and as he is a rabbi in, in the Netherlands, he has connections to the Christian community. And so there's a lot of dialogue going on uh, in, within the Christian community. Now, what's interesting about about uh, Manasseh ben Israel is he has some of the same ideas that uh, evangelical Christians are accused of, and he's thinking that, that we need to get the, the Jews back into England because God said he's, before he allows them to go back to, to the land, they have to be scattered to the four corners of the earth. Well, they're not in one corner of the earth. They're not in England. So we have to get the Jews back into England so that the restoration could occur. That's his basic point. And so there's dialogue between the Christian and Jewish community. Another thing that happens is there's conflicts over religious liberty in England. This is important. You have people uh, that, that, that want to have full equality of religious freedom across the board for everybody in England, and, and especially the Jews. But if you give religious freedom to the Jews, you've got to give it to the wacko fringe heretic elements within the Pro- Protestant Reformation movement. They don't want to do that. The end result of this is they're not they're going to backdoor letting the Jews come back into the land because if they make it official, they've got to let the wacko heretics have their freedom and they don't want to do that. So it's an interesting compromise that the um, um, British come up with. There's this increasing publication of restoration ideas and pamphlets and commentaries in the 18, uh, 1640s. Then in January 6, 1659, uh, a mother and son, Johanna and Ebenezer Cartwright, petitioned Parliament to readmit the Jews. And their petition is brought to uh, the General Council of Officers and Lord Fairfax on January the 5th, 1649. And as Calvinist luck would have it, Tommy, on the very next day, uh, the Parliament authorizes a trial for Charles I on charges of treason, and so the Cartwright petition uh, will get put on, on hold. And as a result, their petition gets shelved, and nothing really, really happens. Now, here's their petition, and we can uh, look at that, and we'll just look at this section right here. Um, and that the nation of England with the inhabitants of the Netherlands shall be the first and readiest to transport Israel's sons and daughters in their ships to the land promised to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for an everlasting inheritance. So they want to see England at the forefront of the restoration uh, of the Jews. So this impacts the thinking of Manasseh ben Israel. Now, he had some interesting ideas and some interesting notions. One was that he thought that the ten lost uh, tribes of Israel uh, were in America. And he believed that the Messiah would not come back until the Jews were regathered to their historic homeland. And so uh, they need to be uh, readmitted into England. So he then is appealing to the British and as... um, uh, Bill mentioned earlier he ha- is engaged in a lot of correspondence with uh, Dury, who is uh, Cromwell's chaplain. He's uh, uh, and is also on the Westminster Assembly, and with uh, Henry Jesse, who is a um, um, a Baptist. And so there's a lot of correspondence between them over the coming uh, several uh, years. As a matter of fact. Um, he, Manasseh supported his belief in the restoration of the Jews to the land from uh, prophecies in Daniel and Deuteronomy. And he was really dealing with the prophetic text uh, in, in ways that would be very familiar to us. He's treating the prophecies of the Old Testament in terms of a literal uh, literal hermeneutic. And that petition is on your disc. That petition is on, on your disc. Good. Um, 
A work that also came out at this time that called The Apology for the Honorable Nation of the Jews and All the Sons of Israel, written by Edward Nicholas. Now, Bill mentioned that earlier as well. We can't find a record of anybody named Edward Nicholas. This was a pseudonym. Uh, many people think that it was actually Manasseh bin Israel or someone like him for a number, number of reasons. He, unlike the Christian writers at the time who were writing about restoration, he never, this writer never mentions conversion. Neither does he mention anything about the conversion of Muslims. He doesn't say nasty things about the Roman Catholics, uh, and he does have an extended discourse on the identity of the ten tribes as uh, being the Native Americans over in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, It was originally published in Spanish, which was Manasseh bin Israel's uh, native tongue, and so all these factors together seem to suggest it might be him or someone like him. Uh, The pamphlet uh, argues that Jews are still God's chosen people, and in many ways it prefigures uh, arguments against preterism and uh, uh, against uh, some of the other heresies that have come up in recent years that uh, that we're having to deal with. In 1650, uh, Manasseh bin Israel publishes The Hope of Israel, which is dedicated to uh, Parliament and expressing all of these ideas to the Parliament. And this uh, lays a foundation for uh, future dialogues with the leaders in uh, Parliament. There's a petition in 1655 that is uh, uh, to Cromwell to readmit the Jews uh, to England. In 1652, Bill, as you mentioned uh, earlier, Manasseh bin Israel was granted a visit to England, but he didn't go there then because some sort of kerfuffle developed between the British and the, and the Dutch at that point. And so he continued to correspond with Dury and Jesse. And then in uh, 1655, he came to meet at uh, Whitehall uh, with Cromwell. Cromwell firmly believed in the future restoration of the Jews to their, um, to their native homeland, and was very supportive of this, but they had a fundamental problem, and that had to do with this issue with with freedom from religion. So the result was that they decided to reinterpret Edward I's banishment order from 1290 as not to be a standing order, but it was just a temporary executive order. Does this sound familiar? (laughs) Politicians don't change a lot. So there's no official policy shift that took place, but they gave tacit permission for uh, the Muranos who were already present to worship in a designated area and to build a synagogue. And over the next few years, about 400 Jews began to come back uh, into England. Uh, Just wrapping this up, in 1656, uh, Manasseh wrote... um, Quoting at the bottom of the slide there from Daniel 12:7, as also that this our scattering by little and little should be amongst all people from the one end of the earth even to the other, as it is written in Deuteronomy 28:64. I conceive that by the end of the earth might be understood this little island. All right. Now, conclusion. What we see here is there's a shift from a non-literal hermeneutic to a literal hermeneutic that occurs as a result of the Reformation. By the time it works itself out through the 16th century, and you start getting to the 1580s and 1590s, as uh, Bill pointed out in his earlier uh, paper, you start seeing people realize this is a liter- that Israel means the literal, literal Israel, the Jewish. People refers to the literal Jewish people, and as a result, they come to understand that God has a future plan to restore the Jews to their historic national homeland. This is the foundation for the development of British restorationism, which spread throughout British culture in England as well as the colonies. And as he developed in his paper, it spreads throughout the rest of the 1600s and into the 1700s. This takes us up to the major event that occurs at the end of the 18th century, which is a political event, uh, Napoleon's campaign into the Middle East. As he invades the Middle East, suddenly it gets all the Christians excited because he's headed into the Middle East, he's headed into the land of the Bible, and of course the British Christians think that maybe Napoleon's the Antichrist, So they, and they, they come out of a historicist, premillennial uh, background, so they think that that this will, I, now you show up. I've been talking about you, Bill, for the last 20 minutes, and now you show up. Okay. 
Um, I said only good things. So we have Napoleon's campaign into the Middle East. Now, what this does is it increases French and British presence in the Middle East. And this is going to start to explode by the time we get to the 1830s. So if you wondered why the French were getting Syria and the British were getting the mandate uh, for uh, uh, Palestine uh, after World War I, it goes back 100 years to when their, their presence started began to develop after the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, there are a lot of speculation about end times increased, and the British people were convinced that they would be used by God uh, eventually to restore the Jewish people uh, to the land. Now, as the time goes by, we see the also uh, beginnings of Jewish interest in restoration and a certain response to the restoration movement. You can imagine that in the Jewish community, when you have all of this British restorationist talk going on, and it's always within the framework of conversion, that that's going to have some sort of reaction within uh, the Jewish community. And during this time, there was... Um, Within the Jewish community, there was a lot of assimilation into Western Europe culture. And as a result of that, in the 1700s, they were becoming more optimistic about their future, but also less focused on any return to the uh, wilderness of their historic homeland. There was also a certain amount of fear about conversionist motivations uh, present in the restorationist message. Now, until this time, restoration was all in, within the Jewish context was always thought to be associated with the coming of the Messiah. They would not be restored to the land until uh, the Messiah came. This was stated in a three-volume work published by Rabbi David uh, Levy in uh, between 1796 and 1800 in uh, in America called the Dissertations on the Prophecies of the Old Testament, containing all such prophecies as are applicable to the coming of the Messiah, the restoration of the Jews, and the resurrection of the dead, whether so applied by Jews or Christians. That was before we got sound bites and, you know, two-word titles. So everything, you had to read a long time to just get the title. He affirms the um, future restoration of the Jewish people to their national homeland, he, though he rejected any speculation about when that might come about. He believed that the restoration, like the Exodus, would be a miraculous, uh, miraculous work of God. I've got some quotes from him that you can read about. On the other side of the aisle, within the Jewish community, I've always heard that where there are three Jews, there are four opinions. That often happens. A lot of discussion. In 1809, Solomon Bennett writes a work called The Constancy of Israel, where he uh, opined that the, um, that the Messiah was important to Christians, but to Jews, not so much. And uh, he believed that the diaspora was the absolute will of God, and so why are we talking about going back to the land? So that's the other side of, of the thinking within the Jewish community. Then about this same time, you get a significant figure come forward, in an American businessman, Mordecai Manuel Noah, who's a lawyer, playwright, journalist, army major. He's a high sheriff, a, di a diplomat, and he believed he was the second Manasseh bin Israel. And he delivers a disc, among many other things, he delivered a discourse at the Congregation Sharif in, in New York on April the 17th, 1818, challenging the congregation to look to the land of Israel and to support those who wished to return. And he, he comes to believe that the Jews should return to the land, but they should do it through America. Uh, there's a beginning to be a rise of anti-Semitism in Germany and a rise of anti-Semitic activity in, in, uh, in, in Russia as well. He sent copies of his address to three ex-presidents, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison, and Adams replied, I really wish the Jews again in Judea, an independent nation, for as I believe the most enlightened uh, of it have participated in the amelioration of the philosophy of the age. So this is significant. Now, at the same time, you have the ramping up of British restorationism uh, through the uh, impact of a man named J Joseph Fry. Joseph Fry was the son of a rabbi who became a Christian in 1798. He was raised in an Orthodox Jewish home. 
He uh, becomes a Christian and he comes to England and he's working among the poor in London in in the East End. And he realizes that many of them are poor Jews. And so he decides to establish a subunit within the London Missionary Society called the Society for the Promoting of Christianity Among the Jews. Uh, It was also known as the LJS, the London Jew Society, and that was founded in uh, 1809. Uh, One of the key benefactors of the uh, LJS was a man by the name of Lewis Way, who who is wealthy, and he begins to travel Europe uh, after the Napoleonic Wars and building support for a Jewish homeland. Uh, Jewish author Franz Kobler, in his uh, his work, uh, notes the significance of the timing uh, and his book is called The Vision Was There, and he notes the significance of the timing that Lewis Way appears in England and the continent at the same time that uh, Mordecai Noah is arriving on the stage of the United States. And he says that both men were distinguished by the tendency to work out a synthesis between legal and national emancipation. So here we see somebody on the Christian side and somebody on the Jewish side not connected in any way, but they're working towards the same ends, and that has a significant impact on both sides of the aisle. About this same time, uh, Joseph Wolf uh, was converted. He also was a son of a rabbi, raised in an Orthodox home. He converted to Christianity in 1812. Um, immigrated to England in 1818 and entered the Anglican Church. In 1822, he went to Jerusalem as a missionary uh, for the uh, London Jew Society, and his ministry there had such an impact that it gave Lewis Way the vision to establish a mission in Jerusalem. Now, that's important because that vision culminates in the building of Christ Church, which if you've been to Jerusalem, that's just inside the Jaffa Gate. Let me say something. If any of you have ne- have you haven't been to Israel, you need to go. There's I notice there's three or four different people who are uh, promoting different tours. Randy's got a tour going. There's two or three others that are out there. Look into those. I've got one going next next November. But any of these are good. It's really important. You'll never read the newspaper or your Bible the same again. And when you go in the Jaffa Gate, you just go a short ways, and there's uh, there's a Christ Church, and this is how that um, how that developed. And so you have this idea of developing a mission to the Jews, and this becomes quite significant over the coming uh, the coming decades. So, at the same time, politically. Politically, what we see in 1819 is there's an increased persecution of Jews in Germany. Mordecai Noah calls for Jews to immigrate to Palestine, and if you can't quite get there, uh, come through the United, United States. In the 1820s, there's an increased anti-Semitism under Alexander I and then his son Nicholas I in Russia, where they have policies enforcing a military draft of young Jewish boys at the age of 12 before their bar mitzvah, and they're going to force them to be converted. They're going to force baptism on them, and uh, this is an attempt to destroy the Jewish community, uh, and about 75% of the Jews worldwide at this time are living uh, in the Pale of Settlement in uh, what is now Belarus, uh, Poland, uh, Ukraine, and, and that area. And so there's increasing persecution there that is putting pressure on the Jewish community to, to do something, to somehow get away, from, uh, get away from this. Now, at the same time, in 1825, uh, Mordecai Noah persi- participated in the inauguration of an island community uh, on the Niagara River in New York, uh, they, they called the city Ararat a city of refuge for the Jews on the Grand Island in the Niagara River. And what, though it was never built, its historical significance, it's the first time a Jew comes together with uh, Christian leaders to initiate the revival of the Jewish people in a restored nation. And so this momentum begins uh, to, to develop. Uh, Historian Alex Carmel writes that the uh, political context of Palestine during the 1830s then facilitates the marriage of British religious sentiments and strategic interests. So you get politics being influenced by uh, Christianity, by, by religion, and this in turn impacts 
the, the government's view of what they're going to do in the, the Holy Land. And so they are going to, uh, they, one thing they all had in common was that they were unanimous in their aspiration to prepare suitable conditions in the Holy Land for the conversion of the Jews. So this is still part of their, uh, part of their desire. Now the next thing that happens politically, and this is the, the key time period here is really from about 1831. All of what I just said is just to set the stage. From 1831 to 1845, it's one of those time periods, especially from about 1837 to 1841, that is just explosive. In 1831, there is a revolt by uh, the ruler of Egypt against the Ottoman Empire. And so we're introduced to the first, uh, Muhammad Ali. And he's going to, uh, the Ottoman Empire is going to be stung by the Muhammad Ali B. He rebels in autumn, uh, against the Ottoman Empire. In 1832, he captures Jerusalem, uh, Acre, uh, Accra, uh, Damascus, and Aleppo. And then in 1833, he's going to permit European missionaries into the Holy Land. And he, he wants European, this will draw European powers uh, into the Holy Land, and he wants to use that to uh, give him leverage against the Ottoman Empire. And then also at this same time, you have uh, the British consul in Cairo, whose name is Campbell, uh, urges the British government to establish a British consulate in Jerusalem. This actually occurs in 1839. A British consulate opens in Jerusalem. And at, in 1839, the uh, Egyptian navy defeats the Ottoman navy. The Ottoman navy surrendered, took all the ships into Alexandria, into port, and surrendered uh, over to the Egypt. Well, this really upsets the European powers because they're trying to maintain a balance of power uh, in the Middle East. France is backing Egypt, and uh, Britain and the other powers are backing the Ottoman Empire. They don't want the Ottoman Empire to collapse because that's going to create too much instability in the region. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Uh, too much instability in the region. The British want to, uh, want, to, want to protect their land route to India as, as well as uh, w- water route later on becomes important. Now, at this same time in 1839, the uh, London Jew Society missionary, who's, I believe, Norwegian, John Nick, Nicolaisen, purchases two plots of land inside the Jaffa Gate, and this will eventually become the location of the Christ Church. At the same time, 1839, you have Sir Moses Montefiore. He's a fascinating family. Um, his, one of his descendants just wrote a book on Jerusalem, the biography. And uh, you're not going to like the theology that comes out in it, but it's, a, it's an interesting read. He kind of, he plays with some facts and details and everything, but what, what he, he talks about how the family got their fortune. This is one of the primary uh, benefactors and money men supporting uh, movements of Jews to, to the land. And they had a network of messengers uh, throughout uh, France and England and basically what happened is his family found out that Napoleon uh, got defeated at Waterloo about a day before anybody else, and so they sold short and had some insider trading, and they made buku bundles of money, which helped to uh, uh, keep many, many Jewish settlers alive for the next uh, 100 years. Uh, in his diary, he writes in, on May 24, 1839, By degrees, I hope to induce the return of thousands of our brethren to the land of Israel. So restoration in the Jewish community is starting to get a little traction. Now that's 1839. In 1840, you have a number of other instances take place. One of the most significant is that a Serbian rabbi by the name of Judah Alkali uh, begins to teach uh, and to write that the Jewish people can return to their historic homeland without the Messiah. They can, just, they can just go back. So he calls upon his fellow Jews to repair, prepare for the redemption uh, by prayer and spiritual devotion to Zion. He reinterprets the meaning of Teshuvah to repent or return uh, as return to the land and that the Jews need to return to the land. They don't need to wait for Messiah. He eventually made Ali, Aliyah in the, 18, in the 1870s. That's significant. Now, on the political side, you have enough, and, and, well, the whole mix. I just wanted to list these things. In February of 1840, there's the Damascus blood libel. And this is when uh, seven Jews were accused of, of murdering um, 
a Christian in order to use his blood in order to make uh, uh, matzah for Passover. Uh, this uh, really explodes throughout much of that year in terms of policy. Uh, England wants to, is, it comes in, uh, the British consulate in Jerusalem comes in to help uh, defend the Jews uh, along the same way. But other things are happening. Also in February, first the first construction begins at the future Christ Church site inside the Jaffa Gate. In the Jewish community, in March of that year, just a month after the blood libel charge develops, the rabbis in Jerusalem asked the London Jew Society missionary, Nicolaisen, to help them defend their Jewish brethren in Damascus against the libel. Uh, Montefiore goes to Damascus after consulting with uh, Lord Shaftesbury and Palmerston in England. Uh, politically, there's a revolt. The Druze and the Christians revolt against Muhammad, so we've got to push the Egyptians back out of the uh, Holy Land. And then at the end of this year, King uh, William IV of Prussia uh, s- puts out feelers to the Anglican Church in England to uh, establish a joint Protestant bishopric in Jerusalem. There are no Protestants there. There's Coptics, there's uh, uh, Syrian Christians, there's Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholics, but but no Protestants. So they want to establish the first uh, Protestant uh, bishopric there. England, Russia, Austria, and Prussia issue an ultimatum to uh, Muhammad to withdraw from Syria, Palestine. The British then capture Acre and uh, Jaffa, which leads to a permanent British fortification at Acre, uh, at Acre, and um, uh, in support of the Ottomans. They also begin to develop a position at uh, Cyprus. I didn't get who quoted this, so I don't have the source, but someone said, the possession of Acre would open a road for the return of biblical truth to the land from which that truth had spread to the human race. And the and Englishmen would feel guilty of sin if they failed to impress upon their government the need of seizing this glorious and blessed opportunity. So in Britain, this is seen as the perfect opportunity then uh, because they have rescued the Ottoman Empire. They can move into the area and they can uh, establish a help establish a homeland so the Jews can return to a safe and secure environment. One of the key leaders was a Christian, a distant cousin of Winston Churchill. He's the British consul in Damascus in 1840. He is a committed Christian Zionist. In fact, he had an idea for restoring the Jews to the land, uh, just like Herzl does some uh, 50 years later, And uh, except he doesn't have the uh, hearing within the Jewish community. Uh, he defended the Jews uh, in Damascus against the blood libel charge, and proposed a strategy for creating a Jewish state 50 years before Herzl. He says in a letter to Montefiore, I cannot conceal from you my most anxious desire to see your countrymen endeavor once more to resume their existence as a people. In 1841, uh, there's the joint venture between the King of Prussia and the Anglican Church, and they anoint uh, the first Jewish Christian Protestant Bishop of Jerusalem, Michael Solomon Alexander. Now, closing out this decade, what I want to impress upon you is a number of different things that are happening politically. You have the invasion from Egypt by uh, Muhammad Ali. You have uh, the the uh, response from the European powers, from the British and the French, and they get drawn more into the Middle East. You have the movement of the uh, Anglican missionaries to establish a, a mission in Jerusalem and a Protestant bishop. And what comes out of this is as more and more uh, Jewish refugees come out of uh, the pale of settlement and come down their cobblers and their uh, peddlers and they have different professions, but they're not farmers. And many of them are starving to death. And it's at this time that the Christian missionaries that are there uh, are, are, of course, they have a conversion motivation, but they begin to realize that their motivation is just to help the Jewish people survive. And so you begin to see a shift in their motivation as they, they fall in love more and more with the Jewish people as Jewish people, not just as sort of objects of conversion. One of the last key people in this period is Zvi Hirsch Kalischer, who's uh, very similar to uh, Judah Alkali in his views. In 1843, he wrote a book called Emuna Yeshara, uh, Yeshara 
an honest faith. He has three objectives, the salvation, three key statements. The salvation of the Jews could take place without the Messiah. Second, the colonization of, colonization of Palestine should be launched without delay. And third, the revival of sacrifices in Palestine was completely permissible. He has four basic things that he suggests need to be done. The first is that there should be a formation of a society of rich Jews to begin colonization, that these settlements of Jews should be from all kinds of backgrounds and trades and skills. Uh, They should get involved in training young Jews in self-defense, and they should establish an agricultural school to teach farming and other uh, agricultural uh, skills. This is what took place uh, during this uh, this particular time, and they established um, uh, in, near Jaffa in 1870 a uh, agricultural school called Mikva uh, Mikva Israel. Kalisher writes to the traditional view that the Messiah will suddenly loose a blast on the great shofar and cause all the inhabitants of the earth to tremble. On the contrary, the redemption will begin with the generating of support among philanthropists and with the gaining of the consent of the nations to the gathering of the scattered of Israel into the Holy Land. Now, another key figure that pops up, we're going to skip to about 1870, but in between you have one of Karl Marx's uh, uh, fellow students, Moses Hess, who was completely overshadowed by Marx. He was just as much a, a socialist and communist as Marx, but he... He, he just didn't get all the fame. And because of that, he decided to go back and restudy the Jewish question. And he comes to a realization that in terms of assimilation, that that's not the answer. The Jews will always be strangers among the nations, so a return to the land is indispensable. He said a Jewish host, homeland was the last best hope, and he predicted the need for governments to collaborate the Gentile governments to collaborate in reviving a Jewish nation. But unfortunately, he had little or no impact. Nobody read him, but his ideas were similar to those of Herzl that would come uh, somewhat later. Now, politically, you have uh, the death of, uh, of Nicholas and his son becomes the Tsar Alexander II. He reverses all of the anti-Semitic policies of his father. This ushers in a period of time known as the Haskalah. This is the Jewish uh, Enlightenment uh, within Russia. And they basically are allowed to leave the Pale of Settlement, to leave the shtetls, and to go to university and develop professions. And so there's this explosion uh, of cultural development within the Jewish community and spreading throughout uh, Russia. And so during this time, there were many leaders who wrote about this ideal of becoming fully assimilated uh, into Russian society and culture. And so this became the ideal uh, to be an assimilated and secular Jew. During this time, uh, at the end of the 19th century, Jewish population increased in Russia from 2.3 million in 1850 to 5 million, uh, which was 4% of the Russian population. And then in 1881, Alexander is assassinated, and that ushers in a new era of uh, virulent anti-Semitism and pogroms under his successor, Tsar Alexander uh, III. He's a virulent anti-Semite, and he issues in 1882 a series of anti-Jewish decrees known as the May Laws. He closed all rural areas to Jewish settlement, forcing them into urban ghettos, and remove Jews from the professions, uh, as the government hope was to uh, destroy a third of the Jewish population uh, within a couple of decades. Now, this so disillusioned the Jewish leaders of the uh, Haskalah that they abandoned all hope in assimilation. So what's happened here is their hope is in assimilation. The way we'll solve the, the question of anti-Semitism is we're going to assimilate. We're going to be just like every We're going to think of ourselves as Russians first, Jews second. We're going to lose our identity and just disappear into the culture. And they realize that can't happen. And so they realize the only hope is they have to get out of Dodge. They have to head somewhere, They and ultimately they have to have a country of their own. That's the only way the Jewish people can have safety and security. And so you have one of the leaders of the Haskalah, Moshe uh, Lillenblum, writes, 
Let us go now to the only land in which we will find relief for our souls that have been harassed by murderers for these thousands of years. Our beginnings will be small, but in the end, we will flourish. Now, at this time, so we've seen the political developments as it's putting pressure upon the Jewish community in Russia and the Pale of Settlement. And where do they go? And we see several things that develop. One thing that's starting to develop is the rise uh, and appearance of a man in uh, 1873 by the name of William Heckler. Uh, He is born into a uh, Christian home. His father's a missionary uh, with the uh, uh, London Jew Society. So he is reared in a home where he is taught the importance of the restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land, and he has a passion for Israel. He also has a lifelong desire to bring the Jewish people to Christ. So his motivation begun, begins with a strong conversionist force, but this uh, softens and shifts as time goes by. In 1873, he becomes the tutor to the Grand Duke Frederick of Baden, who's the son of Frederick I and, become, and will be the uncle of Kaiser Wilhelm. Now, this becomes important because he's going to be the one who will take Herzl and introduce him to these influential political leaders so that Herzl's vision for Zionism can have a broader platform than just within the Jewish community because he's not getting a lot of response from the Jews when he first started. Uh, In the 1880s, Heckler is the first of British clergy to visit persecuted Jews in uh, Mogilov, Odessa, and uh, Kishnev, where there have been numerous uh, numerous, uh, uh, pogroms. His ambition in life was to become the Bishop of Jerusalem, so he would be there in time to welcome his Savior uh, when he returned uh, returned to Jerusalem. There's always people that have funny ideas. Uh, is um, another thing that happens at this same time is a novel is written by George Eliot, who is the pen name of Marianne Evans, and her her novel is about a Jew who is uh, reared in a. Re- I'm ex- I'll get to that in a minute. She's reared in a restorationist evangelical home. This one thing all these influential people have is they're brought up in a Christian home where they're taught a value, a love for the Old Testament and the Jewish people. Though she later lost some of her evangelical beliefs, her love for the Jewish people continued to increase without, throughout her life. In her novel, da- Daniel Deronda is a secular Jew. Uh, his mother is so fearful of anti-Semitism that she wants to raise him without any knowledge of his Jewish background whatsoever. He doesn't uh, discover he's Jewish until he is uh, 17 or 18 years of age. Eventually he gets married and he makes Aliyah. I'm leaving a lot out. But the significance of this novel is that it, it, it influences many Jews, gives them a vision to go back to the land of Israel, including two key people, uh, Ben Yehuda, who resurrects the Hebrew language and eventually makes Aliyah. And at the point that he and his wife move back to Israel, they re, you know, if you've been to Jerusalem, you've been to Ben Yehuda Street. Uh, it's named after him. Uh, he's the one who resurrected the Hebrew language. And when his family moved back, they refused to say anything in any language other than Hebrew. And so he's responsible for the renaissance of the spoken Hebrew language. Also, Ben-Gurion uh, reads Daniel Deronda, and it influences him to make Aliyah. So again, we see the influence of Christian writers, Christian restorationism upon uh, the, the Jewish culture. Uh, Nahum Sokolov, who was also present at, um, uh, we learned from uh, Dr. Gautier last night, he was present at, at San Remo. Uh, Sokolov, and it worked with Akim Weissman a lot, <coughs> excuse me, says of Daniel Duranda, <coughs> in the Valhalla of the Jewish people, among the tokens of homage offered by the genius of centuries, Daniel Duranda will take its place as the proudest testimony to the English recognition of the Zionist idea. Now, at the same time, you have uh, a disillusionment with what is the assimilationist approach in, uh, in, in Russia, and you have the rise of a key leader named Leon Pinsker, whose basic thought is it's now or never we need to go back to our native homeland. So he reacts in disillusion to a brief program that occurred in Odessa. That's, in, over there it's Odessa. Here it's Odessa. Okay. 
They, so he, there's a brief program in Odessa in 1871. In 1882, he writes his book, Auto Emancipation, and states that the Jewish people have no fatherland of its own, no center of gravity, no government of its own, no official representation. And he's the first to write a systematic argument describing the vulnerability of the Jewish people and becomes a leader in a group called the Chovevi Zion uh, which is a group of different Zionist study circles and clubs that began to pop up all over the pale uh, of settlement. And they were developing different ways and strategies to make uh, Aliyah and go to, uh, go to Israel. He's one of the key movers and shakers uh, there. Then about this same time, we go back to uh, William Heckler. He writes a book called The Restoration of the Jews According to the Prophets in 1883. Uh, in that he says the duty of every Christian is to pray earnestly and to long for the restoration of God's chosen race and to love the Jews, for they are still beloved for their father's sake. In 1885, he's appointed the chaplain of the British Embassy in Vienna. Now we're going to cross the pond and see the Christian influence in the U.S. We have a Christian businessman by the name of William E. Blackstone, uh, who in 1888 makes a trip to the Holy Land with his daughter, and he realizes that the only hope from perse- safety for persecution from the Jewish people was restoration to their historic homeland. In 1890, he called for a conference in Chicago on the past, present, and future of Israel. Out of that came a petition to uh, uh, President Harrison called the Blackstone Memorial, which was motivated in part by the uh, increasing pogroms in Russia during the 1880s. Uh, In that, uh, he had uh, 413 prominent Christian and a few Jewish leaders signed the memorial, uh, including uh, uh, including John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, Cyrus McCormick, uh, various senators, congressmen, and Supreme Court justices. It's rediscovered in... um, in, in the early 1900s uh, by Louis Brandeis, who was a Supreme Court justice as well, and they took it to President uh, um, uh, Wilson. Uh, he signed it in secret. He wouldn't make a public pronouncement about it. In there, he, he argues, uh, why shall not the powers which under the Treaty of Berlin in 1878 gave Bulgaria to the Bulgarians and Serbia to the Serbians now give Palestine back to the Jews? These provinces, as well as Romania, Montenegro, and Greece, were wrested from the Turks and given to their natural owners. Does not Israel as rightfully belong to the Jews? In 1960, Nathan Strauss wrote to the Reverend Blackstone uh, on behalf of Louis Brandeis and said, Mr. Brandeis agrees with me that you are the father of Zionism as your work antedates Herzl. Now we come to the last part, which is uh, introduction to uh, uh, Theodore Herzl. Uh, The context is the Dreyfus uh, trial in uh, France. Dreyfus was a French Jewish artillery officer who was fully assimilated uh, into uh, French culture, thought of himself as a Frenchman, not as a Jew. But because of the latent anti-Semitism in French culture, uh, he becomes uh, framed for treason. And he's accused of spying for the Russians. There's a huge public trial. He's convicted on treason. Uh, he's sent to Devil's Island, though he is eventually, in about 10 years, a- exonerated. But the trial is significant because it exposed the ugly reality of, uh, uh, of how profound anti-Semitism was in the French culture. A journalist assigned to cover it was Theodore Herzl, at which time uh, he realizes there's no hope in assimilation. He was educated in an assimilationist Jewish home in Vienna, uh, brought up on Jewish Enlightenment thought. Uh, he is... Uh, uh, from 1892 on, before the Dreyfus trial even, he focused more and more on the problem of anti-Semitism in his writings. But at the Dreyfus trial, he heard the crowds shouting, death to the Jews, and he realized that there was no hope for the Jews in assimilation. In 1896, he published Der Judenstadt, where he writes, we are a people, one people, We have sincerely tried everywhere to merge with the national communities in which we live, seeking only to preserve the faith of our fathers. It has not been permitted us. So what was the consequence? Well, the assimilated and wealthy elite of European Jews rejected his vision as dangerous to the Jewish community. But along came William Heckler. 
1896, he read Der Judenstadt, and in March he showed up unannounced at Herzl's apartment. And he is the chaplain. Uh, Herzl writes in his diary, The Reverend William uh, Heckler, chaplain to the British Embassy in Vienna, called on me. He's a likable, sensible man with the long gray beard of a prophet. He waxed enthusiastic over my solution. He, too, regard, regards my movement as a prophetic crisis, one he foretold two years ago. For he had calculated in accordance with prophecy dating from Omar's reign that after 42 prophetical months, that is 1,260 years, Palestine would be restored to the Jews. That would make it 1897 or 1898. See, most British pre-mills at this time that are, that are uh, pro-Israel are also historicists. They're not uh, futurists as, as we are. That's from Herzl's diary. I think I duplicate. Um, so what happens is that, that uh, Heckler is able to arrange meetings with the Kaiser because of his connections with the Duke of Baden, whom he had taught uh, British restorationism to. He arranges meetings with the Sultan in Constantinople. Uh, later on, he arranged uh, another meeting, an audience for Herzl uh, with the Kaiser in Istanbul and following that also in uh, Jerusalem. In fact, an article appeared in the San Antonio, uh, Texas Daily Light. I thought I would bring it home to Texas. Stating that the new Jewish state, Vienna, August 8th, uh, talking about the first Zionist conference, the informal negotiation set on foot last year for the establishment of a Jewish autonomous state in Syria made considerable progress. And a meeting was held on the 6th under the auspices that of the Maccabean Society to consider the report of Dr. Theodore Herzl of Vienna, the author of the new scheme, although no organization has yet formed. Okay, how's my time? we got about ten, five minutes. Okay. I'll just say a couple of things about the Balfour Declaration. Uh, the primary motivation is the religious beliefs of the war cabinet of the British government in uh, 1917. Uh, Lloyd George is the primary mover and shaker, is the prime minister, and he comes out of a strong um, restorationist uh, ba- Baptist uh, background and uh, the others are also motivated by their love for the Jewish people. That's not the only factor. You will read in different books, different reasons. I think that they're all true to some degree, but the reality is is there's a framework, an environment within their thinking where they are uh, they have been taught from their mother's knee to love the Jewish people. In fact, David Lloyd, Lloyd George is often quoted as saying that that he, when he read the Bible, he was more familiar with the place names in Israel than he was uh, with the battles that were going, taking place in France in World War One. So this is their background. Uh, uh, the best conclusion, I think, is that though there are other factors are present, it's clear from the early statements of Balfour and others that neither gratitude towards Weizmann for his contribution to the British war effort through various uh, 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 scientific discoveries, he developed a method of making uh, acetate that was used in, uh, in explosives, um, nor desire for Jewish support for the war effort or imperial instra- I- I- expansion were the determinative factors. But they were factors. I mean, the British government is not going to authorize something like the Balfour Declaration unless they're going to get something out of it. Uh, that was part of it. But the, f- the, the environment, the framework, was the, the British restorationism that had been part of the culture uh, for the last uh, 100 to 200 years. Here's a copy of the uh, Balfour Declaration. Uh, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other uh, country. I think it's important to note, as Dr. Gautier observed last night, is that this was just a, a wish and a hope on the part of the British government. They didn't have the authority, they didn't have the ownership of the land uh, to do anything. What's significant is not the Balfour for declaration in and of itself, but the fact that it becomes incorporated word for word in the San Remo resolutions, which gave it the force of international law. In terms of the background of those who served on the War Council, uh, Lloyd George was Welsh, 
and he was Baptist. Arthur Balfour was a Scot. He was Presbyterian. Arthur Henderson was also a Scot. He was a Methodist lay preacher. George Barnes, Barnes was Scottish, but we don't know what his religious background was. Andrew Boner Law was born in Canada, but when he was 12, he moved to live with an aunt in Scotland, and he was, uh, his father was a pastor, and he was uh, raised in the Free Church of Scotland. Edward Montague is... What? Andrew Bonar Law was Andrew Bonar was a famous Scottish famous Scottish preacher for whom he was named. Uh, Edward Montague was Jewish, and he was in opposition. He's the only one who voted against it, uh, although uh, because he was an assimilationist. Lord Curzon was hostile to it all the way along, but he eventually voted for it. But he thought that it was going to suck Britain into just a whole. A host of problems in the Middle East. He's the only one who had ever been in the Middle East, and so the reason he opposed it was because not not because he was anti-Zionist, but because he just thought Britain Britain was going to get sucked into a big problem. And um, uh, then there's Edward Car- Carson, who was Irish, Irish Presbyterian. Uh, Jan Christian Smuts was from South Africa, and he was raised a Dutch Calvinist. And Alfred Milner was German-born. We don't know his religious affiliation. What's interesting is the the, the two men that were in opposition to the Balfour Declaration, Edward Montague and Lord Curzon, were English. All of the others were not English. They were Scots, Irish, South African, born in Germany, born in Canada. So it, it is, the, and, but they were the ones who were heavily influenced with an evangelical, uh, evangelical background. So we see throughout history that there is this uh, orchestration by the sovereignty of God using many different people with many different motivations from many different countries that come together uh, step by step, year by year, to bring about uh, the restoration of the Jewish people to the land, which ultimately culminates in 1948 with the birth of a a modern Jewish state. It couldn't happen by chance. Nobody could have orchestrated. I've heard people say, well, you know, Christians who love the Jews, you just wanted self-fulfilling prophecy, you made it happen. How can this be? This is impossible for all of these different things to have come together uh, under human endeavor. It is the work of God that brought about the resurrection of the Jewish state. Thank you very much. Okay, any any questions? Uh, Jan Smuts was uh, the from South Africa, and he was probably the second greatest Christian Zionist in the war cabinet. He was the only one who lived to see the Jewish state come into That's correct. And he was the prime minister of South Africa, and he he was upset that Truman beat him to be the first country to recognize Israel. Israel. And he was a lay preacher, uh, and he preached many, many sermons throughout his life, you know, uh, uh, defending restorationism. He also was in the war cabinet in World War II. So he was in World War I and World War II war cabinet as well. He was a general. Yep. Big time guy. Any comments or questions? Anybody still awake? Yes. I know this stuff is probably new to many people and you don't have a framework to ask questions or you know, you're overwhelmed like I have been in the past. Drew, there's a microphone right over there if you'd use that, please. Okay. First of all, thank you for coming and speaking. I really appreciate um, hearing the wonderful things that I've been hearing at this conference. Second, there's one thing that I heard that stood out to me when you were talking about the um, belief of the uh, return to Israel is that in the end times, all the Jews would be uh, assassinated or killed or exterminated. Um, that's something that I know is not really widespread, but in my work in, uh, with Jewish leaders to bring them closer to the dialogue with the evangelical Christians, I hear that a lot. And I hear that, well, we don't want to talk to them because they believe we need to be exterminated in the end of times. Um, what, w- what advice would you give to the people that do outreach with the Jewish community or between uh, dialogue between the groups um, to See, address that issue that they okay, make that's, up with. Okay, that's easy. That's a distortion of what Christians believe. What Christians believe is that there's going to be this end-time figure called the Antichrist, mm-hmm. and he's going to make Hitler look like a wannabe, and he's going to 
hate the Jews and seek to destroy all of the Jews. But it's going to be the return of Jesus that delivers the Jews. So the return of Je- Jesus doesn't lead to the death and destruction of Jews, but the deliverance of the Jews in Israel. Yeah, but so, that view I first heard from preterists back in the uh, 19, or, uh, late 80s. Um, and it, I've only heard that within anti-Christian Zionist communities, you know, or, right. or people. And most Christians who are pro-Israel are shocked to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> that that's why uh, Christians want to see the Jews return so they'll be killed, you know, and stuff like this. But it's so common among critics of Christian Zionism, you know, uh, whether Gentile or Jewish, that, uh, you know, that it fits into their thing. A lot of uh, these critics of Christian Zionism take stuff from the 1800s, you know, like uh, Jesus can't come back till the Jews are in the land of Israel. I don't know anybody today that believes that. No. You know, but it was true in the 1600s with Cromwell. In fact, John Owen gave a sermon in the British Parliament, you know, arguing that, the famous John Owen. And uh, so you have this stuff, and these people who aren't really familiar with what we actually believe read something that somebody believed 300 years ago um, coming from a totally different uh, premillennial or Christian framework, and they impose it on us today. And I don't know anybody within our movement who actually believes that kind of stuff. Go ahead. No, I'm, in fact, I've never heard anybody say any of those three things to be true other than uh, I've heard it from, from some within the Jewish community who are, uh, who've heard it somewhere or those who are opposed to us. I've never, I was shocked the first time I heard any of those things. I'd never heard anybody say, say those things. So, but it's widely yeah. talked about in academic books and things right. about us. Go ahead over here. Other than the Messianic believers and uh, conservative talk show hosts like uh, Michael Medved, uh, Dennis Preger, the Jewish community as a whole is rather liberal, of course. Are there any Jewish leaders that are promoting Zionism in America? You know, it's oh, yeah. Yeah, because you have a lot, a lot of connection between, uh, like with Kufi, with John Hagee's organization, Christians United for Israel. And you have um, uh, within the, um, uh, a number of Jewish organizations within just the last, I would say, s- six to eight years have really put on a major push to reach out to the evangelical community because they realize, as, as Netanyahu and others have stated over the last 20 years, is that the best friends that the, that the Israelis have are the evangelical Christians in America. So there, there's a huge outreach effort to, to, to connect and to build bridges between the Jewish community and the evangelical Christian Zionist community. Any of the rabbis coming on board on this? Yeah. Do you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, we just had, a, had an event in Houston where I brought in a, um, she was going to be here, but something came up. Uh, she's a student. She's been mentored by Michael Rydelnik, who's going to be speaking in the morning. Uh, she is a representative with Stand With Us, which is a pro-Israel organization. She's a Filipino Christian. She's the only Christian who works for this pro-Israel Jewish organization. And we had a joint um, event in Houston with uh, the largest uh, conservative congregation in the U.S., which is Beth Yashern. And we, brought, we had about 100 uh, teenagers, Christian and Jewish teens, come together so that she could get them all fired up on why they need to learn how to be better advocates for Israel. And, and I worked with uh, uh, the rabbi from Beth Yashern on that. He was more than happy to give us the space because some of these kids, Jewish kids were coming, were Orthodox, so they couldn't set foot in a Christian church. So he was more than happy to, to open his doors to let us come and, and do that. Just something you can comment on. Um, when you were talking about how the British were so um, instrumental in getting the restoration started, it just dawned on me. I had always wondered why Britain was such a little bitty island and it was such a big influence around the world. And I just sort of dawned on me that God blessed Britain because of their support of the Jews that they may have become that big empire and then they declined after they started rejecting the new 
Right. Right, and then America was blessed because we were blessing it. You know, you see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I think that's it just true. I think that, the, you know, that's one factor that God was blessing the British because of their love for the Jewish people. And then when they started turning against him in the 20s, um, then God began to uh, uh, pull his support away, and uh, you have the judgment. God says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Randy. Yeah, there's a recent book it's published by Yale. It was on Christopher Columbus in Jerusalem. The rest we, we can't Jerusalem. hear you. You need to get closer to the mic. All right, let me get it higher. There was a book published by Yale a couple of years ago called Christopher Columbus and the Restoration of Jerusalem. And it dealt with uh, research that he had wanted to go to the West and he wanted to get money to fund a means to uh, wrest Jerusalem from the Muslims, to rebuild the temple and then part of restoration views to see the Lord return. Are you know where the sources of any of that come from? Or have you seen any of that? I haven't seen it. The closest to that is I, John Eidsmo wrote a book on Cortez and Columbus at the 500th anniversary back in 1992. And I think he touched on some things like that in his, uh, in his work on Columbus. That, that Columbus had, a, had, a, had an evangelistic motivation in coming to the New World, and that was part of it. And he, well, this had to do with, with freeing Jerusalem right. with, with an apocalyptic uh, kind of idea. Yeah. Yeah, I have a book on that. I just read the first chapter, and they think uh, Columbus was a Morano Jew. Yeah, yeah. Who, yeah. But he was a Christian. Yeah. yeah. You know, a sincere Christian. And he, yeah, they say wanted to do, and the point of the book is that Bible prophecy was the motivation. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and people's influence from the Bible and all of this. And, uh, you know, with with the dominance of our secular world, you know, there's so much out there uh, that the Bible has inspired, you know, in our culture and history and everything. So, well, thank you, Robbie. Appreciate it. <laughs>